Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to this special event, the tribute to Arnold Zabel. You might wonder why the inaugural Antipodes Writers Festival pays special tribute to a non-Greek. It is because the festival aspires to celebrate and honor all those who have honored us by telling our stories. And Arnold Zabel has done exactly that. He has told and continues to tell our stories. Although he is one of the most well-known contemporary Australian writers, allow me to say a few words about him. Arnold Zabel is an acclaimed writer and one of Australia's most loved storytellers. He is an educator and a human rights advocate. Being president of Melbourne Pen, the organization which advocates for writers under persecution around the world, and an ambassador for the Asylum Seekers Resource Center. His books include Jewels and Ashes, The Fig Tree, Cafe Sheker Azande, Scraps of Heaven, and Sea of Many Returns, which is set in the Greek island of Ithaca. His latest book, Violin Lessons, was released last year. But more about Arnold, his connection with Ithaca, the Greeks, and all things Greek, but maybe, most importantly, his contribution to writing and the ancient art of storytelling will hear very, very soon from the co-convener of the Antipodes Writers Festival, a writer herself, a poet, and a source of inspiration, at least to me, Costadina Dumis. Thank you. Uh, I shall use this one. Thank you, Dina. Thank you for your lovely words. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, I would like to begin, since this evening tonight is an evening about storytelling, I would like to begin the evening by acknowledging the original storytellers of this nation. So I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who were the original custodians of this land. I also think it's timely. Last night we were very, very excited and it was the first night and we were a bit nervous. But I think tonight it is very timely to acknowledge also our working party. Our working party, uh, Helen and I were the conveners. Our working party was comprised of Dimitris Thraavitis, Dina Yerolimu and Nick Trakakis. Also, I would like to acknowledge Penny Kiprianou, the cultural officer for the Greek community, and also Chris Cody, who is the person who has tirelessly assisted us with anything to do with things technical. So I would like also to thank them. Now. The year was 2002, a year of many personal transitions. I had left an academic career at RMIT to engage in the sheer joy and luxury of being a full-time mother and struggling, as my family knows, with, the to ve with varying degrees of success with the intricacies of homemaking. One of the many activities that my little girl and I delighted in was spending hours in bookshops. It was during one of these happy sessions that I chanced upon a stunning looking book entitled The Fig Tree. I didn't know who the writer was at that point, but the blurb on the back cover impelled me to buy it on the spot. And it said, The Fig Tree is a book of true stories with an extraordinary scope. It is about family, about home, about the journeys that reveal to us who we are and the ways in which contemporary tales reflect ancient myths. Zabel writes about the rhythms of life on the Greek island of Ithaca and the villagers who made the long journey to Australia. He also weaves tales set in Athens, Thessaloniki, Poland, and Outback Australia, 
and tales of Yiddish actors and writers in search of new audiences in a new land. End of quote. Although I have now reached that moment in my life where I could never envisage living anywhere else other than this vibrant multicultural city of Melbourne, I have always loved my two homelands, Australia and Greece, in equal measure and have been periodically afflicted by acute feelings of nostalgia when I am far from one or the other. That evening I put Sophie to sleep curled up on the front armchair and, with great anticipation, began reading. My husband, my ever-patient husband, found me there at seven in the morning, <laughs> transfixed. I'd clearly been crying, oblivious to all around me. This is how it always unfolds with Arnold Zabel's stories. I can never put them down until I have reached the end. And even then, I'll invariably engage in an immediate secondary reading, the familiarity of which allows for a deeper reflection imbued with sustained resonance. I knew with utter conviction all those years ago that one day I would pay tribute to this extraordinary writer. I knew, though, that I had to be patient and wait for a context that befitted him. When Helen Nickus approached me about co-convening this festival, the context presented itself and I engineered it vigorously. I could talk for hours about Arnold's work, but tonight's tribute is not a lecture, but a celebration. To that end, I'll confine myself to a few biographical notes followed by a brief overview of his seven major publications and uh, ending with a personal anecdote that astonishingly re was revealed to me, that has really revealed to me rather, the unstinting power of stories to transform our perceptions of who we are and by natural extension, who our ancestors are. Arnold Zabel was born in Wellington, New Zealand in 1947 to Polish Jewish refugees Hodes and Maya Zabludowski. Did I, do I say it right, Arnold? Not bad? I oh, doubt it, I doubt it. <laughs> Who originally hailed from the city of Bialystok on the Russian-Polish border. Tragically, both his parents lost their families to the Holocaust or the annihilation, as Arnold hauntingly calls it. The family relocated to Melbourne when Arnold was still a baby, settling in the inner suburb of Carlton. In the 50s and 60s, it was rich with street life, immigrants and working-class Anglo-Australians. He attended Lee Street Primary, Princess Hill High School, which his son Alexander uh, also later attended, the University of Melbourne, Columbia University in New York, from which he gained a master's degree, his formal studies culminating in the doctorate within the creative writing faculty at the University of Melbourne. He has either lectured or been a writer in residence at all of Melbourne's universities, Melbourne, Monash, Deakin, La Trobe, etc. Arnold is a tireless refugee advocate and has written about this issue in columns, essays and features in all the major Australian newspapers and national journals. He is co-writer of the play Kama Yamakan, in which asylum seekers tell their own stories. He was an artist consultant to the recent Asylum Seeker Resource Centre production, Not Just My Story. Given that Arnold's stories focus, and novels focus on the journeys of displaced peoples, that he writes about the lives of those who are forced to seek refuge, and that he speaks and writes about memory and history, displacement and the multiplicity of cultures in this country, it is hardly surprising that he has worked in a range of cross-cultural projects. He has conducted workshops for many groups, including refugees, asylum seekers, immigrants, the homeless, the hearing impaired, and most recently, problem gamblers, 
and, movingly, the survivors of the Black Saturday bushfires. He is, as Dina told us, president of Melbourne Penn, a patron of Sanctuary, a board member of Researchers for Asylum Seekers, an ambassador for the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, and a member of the Victorian Immigration Museum Advisory Committee. His most recent appointment was that of Vice-Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Melbourne. What a deserved honour, Arnold. Given this extraordinary catalogue, it is amazing to me that he finds time to write his novels. But write, he does. His books have all gone on to become bestsellers, Jewels and Ashes, uh, also being published in America, thereby cementing its status globally. Café Scheherazade was adapted into a play that enjoyed one sellout season after another. He has won a swag of awards. I won't name them all, uh, I'll just uh, name a few. The National Book Council Lisbeth Cohen Award, the, Nas the New South Wales Ethnic Affairs Commission Award, the FAWANA Literature Award, the Braille Book of the Year Award, the Talking Book of the Year Award, the Pacific Fiction Prize, People's Choice Award, and even an award for Best Folk Release of 2004 for the CD, The Fig Tree, featuring a diversity of artists, among whom were the late Costa Cicaderis. He and Arnold were very dear friends, and I was very touched to see Costa's daughter here this evening. And of course, with Anthea Sideropoulos, who will be performing later tonight. Arnold has travelled extensively throughout his life and has lived for extended periods of time in America, India, Papua New Guinea, Europe, Southeast Asia and China. He is happily settled in Melbourne now, where he lives with his Greek-Australian wife, Dora, uh, whose family hails from Ithaca, and their son, Alexander, who Arnold informed me with great pride the other day, is studying physics at Melbourne University. And now to the publications, seven in all. The first one, look, I'm dreadful with anything um, to do with technology, so let's see how we go. The first one, in Jewels and Ashes, Arnold explores his family's lost homeland of Bialystok. Uh, somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, Arnold makes the point that us Greeks, or Greek Australians, have a homeland to go back to, have people to go and see, how lo have loved ones to embrace us. Imagine going back and finding nothing, just finding ghosts. Rereading Arnold's work, that really has um, touched my heart very deeply this notion, and particularly rereading this beautiful book that I highly recommend. He tries to make sense of that which lies outside the realm of reasoning, the Holocaust or the annihilation, as I've said, that uh, he refers to it as. How do you make sense of that? How do you get your head around that sort of horror? His parents loom large throughout this extraordinary memoir, their silences, their screams that intermittently accompany their dreams, in the case of his mother, their penchant for words, as in the case of his father, to make sense of the chaos that framed their ancestral home, these are all subtly interwoven with Arnold's pursuit of ancestral ghosts. This book, as I mentioned, I'm sorry, I get very, very moved when I refer to Jewels and Ashes. Um, I read it twice uh, in the last couple of weeks and um, I can't really talk about it yet without being profoundly moved. This book was also published in America, sold very widely, was critically uh, very, very uh, well received. And in the, the American publication cover, there's a small section, uh, one of the few photos of Arnold's family, uh, extended family, back in Bialystok. So very, very moving. Café Scheherazade, uh, published by Text in 2001, is an extremely important book 
that should serve as a prototype of what all immigrant communities should be actively pursuing. And our president of the Greek community mentioned this in his beautiful address last night. And that is the recording of stories before they are irrevocably lost forever. We should be very, very mindful of this as a community and look towards this book uh, for guidance, as I said. Café Scheherazade was a café, was actually a café run from 1958 by Avram and Masha Zenelsikon, right, that became a meeting place for Jewish survivors of the war years. Very moving. I love this next book. I really did. It was something that I came across through getting ready for this tribute, Arnold. This next publication is called Wanderers and Dreamers, Tales of the David Herman Theatre. It was published by Highland Press and is truly a wondrous work. It is essentially the, the story of Yiddish theatre in Melbourne, an amalgam of meticulous attention to detail, I mean it's beautifully researched, and engrossing storytelling as only Arnold can engage in and a series of photographs depicting the actors and the plays they staged. This vibrant, enormously successful theatrical tradition, largely played out in the Kadima Hall in Carlton, began in 1908 when Samuel Weisberg, a famous Yiddish actor, arrived at Port Melbourne with the necessary vision to set up a theatrical troupe. Wiseman acquired a co-producer, I wish I'd met this man, a Reuben Finkelstein, to whom is attributed what surely must be one of the best quips in the history of theatre. A Yiddish adaptation of Shakespeare was accompanied by the line, translated and improved upon the original. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I just, you know, because I was an actress in the 80s, I just, I just loved this, you know. I just thought it was brilliant. Scraps of Heaven, his next book, is a most vivid and loving recollection of growing up in Carlton in the 1950s. It is in four parts, each one under the introductory banner of the four seasons. The title itself refers to the fried scraps of batter that the local Greek fish and chip shop owner would freely distribute to the neighbourhood children. Different nationalities living side by side, the focus of the story resting on the protagonist's family, wrestling with their memories of the devastation wreaked by the Holocaust on their families, their communities, their legacies. The Fig Tree and the Sea of Many Returns, I'm not going to say too much about because Arnold's going to quote from these and I'd rather you hear his words than mine. But this, these two books can really be perceived as Arnold's homage to the ancestry of his wife, Dora. I am not going to say, as I said, too much here, but uh, suffice to say that through these beautiful novels, the lives of Greek immigrants and the lives of those who remained in their homeland are mesmerisingly showcased. These are really beautiful books. And of course, pervading all is the beauty, the harshness and majesty of the island of Ithaca. Arnold's latest publication, Violin Lessons, entails ten short stories that span the globe in terms of landscape, culminating in the unforgettable tale of Amal, a more recent refugee to these shores, who survived the tragic sinking of the ship of refugees bound for Australia in 2001. Arnold, like all master storytellers, your stories have a way of impacting upon the everyday and indeed initiating an environment in which the ongoing narrative can be added to and thereby sustained afresh. Every Sunday, my father, who is sitting here tonight, who is in his 80s, comes to our home for lunch. 
Since my beloved mother's passing, this has become an entrenched ritual. A leisurely lunch, which my husband usually cooks, that's usually the request anyway, that's for sure, because he's the lovely cook in this family. Catching up upon the week's events, an afternoon nap for my dad, followed by tea and cake and more chatting. The Sunday that just passed, so what I'm talking about happened not even, not just five, six days ago. I was terribly preoccupied with this festival. A prohibitively long to-do list was circling around in my head and so lunch was a sort of distracted affair, you know. I, I was at the table but I was not present, you know, thinking of things I had to do. My father, an avid reader, always asks me about any research, any new research I'm undertaking. I was jolted back to the present and mentioned this tribute. I then relayed to him the truly moving account of the Jews of Zakynthos who were saved during the tragic years of the Nazi occupation through the brave actions of the Bishop Chrysostomos who refused to betray them. My father became quiet. I could see that he was on the threshold of recollection. The signs are always a giveaway. The taking off of his glasses, looking straight ahead, laboured articulation. I knew, I could tell, he was back in his seaside village in the 1940s. A young boy up at three o'clock in the morning to help his father shepherd the goats on the mountainside. His father had reluctantly assumed the role of mayor during the treacherous time when the Germans were occupying the school and other buildings around the town square. While father and son were trudging to their particular area halfway up the mountain, they passed one of the many concealed caves, and we saw them with Sophie when we went to Greece recently, that dot the lower reaches. The boy, the little boy, heard voices. The father, a stern patriarch whose word was law, turned to him and told him that the people in there were hiding, that the following night they would be going on board fishing boats, which would then connect with other boats, the whole chain reaction eventually leading them to the Middle East, that the boy must never tell anyone ever what he had just seen. The young boy was scared and he strained to look inside. He expected to see only some men assembled. Instead, he was met by the gaze of frightened men, women and children, babies being cradled in their mother's arms, Jews who had peacefully lived for many generations in the nearby town of Aliveri and the capital city of Halkida. My mother learned dressmaking from one of these Jews who lived in Aliveri, a Jewish seamstress. And moreover, when I, of course, by this stage, I, I was gobsmacked. And, you know, I, I asked, I just asked and asked. And Dad told me this was not a one-off occurrence. It went on for months. The treacherous trek through the labyrinthine mountain paths that only the shepherds could safely navigate, and then the mad scramble to the fishing boats. I sat absolutely stunned through the entire retelling, astonished at what I had just heard and that I was only hearing it by chance after all these years and then overcome by an overwhelming sense of pride that my ancestors could have acted with such bravery and compassion. My mind wandered to those frightened men, women and children and I prayed that they had managed to reach a safe harbour within the pervading nightmare of incessant persecution. The remembrance of this episode owes its inception to the power of storytelling and I felt a melancholy creep over me at the thought that for each story preserved, countless were doomed to oblivion. As is only fitting, I'm going to let Arnold Zabel have the last word on this whole process of storytelling. This gem, one of the countless, is from the story Violin Lessons from the collection of the same name. 
Arnold is referring to some extraordinary coincidences, not unlike mine, obliquely linking one scene to another, and I quote, This last shard of information arrests me. I have found the point the storyteller yearns for, the moment a tale yields its symmetry and attains an unexpected harmony. Perhaps all stories, if pursued, will eventually yield their symmetries, their unexpected meanings. Then again, perhaps this is the storyteller's illusion, an innate longing to make sense of life's fragility and chaos, to contrive order out of what is in reality a play of chance. Perhaps it is enough to tell the story. Thank you. Um, I would just like to, I forgot really, I, I found this tribute very moving and I'd just like to show you some images that Arnold has entrusted me with. Um, this is, as I said, the American edition of Jewels and Ashes. This is Café, the cover, these are all book covers, the, ca the cover for Café Scheherazade. This is a beautiful cover, although they're all beautiful covers, of Scraps of Heaven. This is the one that mesmerised me, the fig tree, all those years ago. This is one of the covers uh, to Sea of Many Returns. I mean, it's been printed and reprinted and reprinted. <laughs> it's sold very well. This is his latest, Violin Lessons. This is your parents, isn't it, Arnold? Very moving. This is uh, uh, Arnold's parents in the 1930s. Is that right, Arnold? Yeah, they're very young. This is Dora's family. Dora? This is Dora's maternal grandfather, and for those of you who have read Sea of Many Returns, uh, this is the gentleman that that mesmeric character mentor is uh, based on. This is Arnold and Dora in Warsaw. Another lovely photo of Arnold from one of the, from his book covers. This is the journey. Is this to Ithaca, Arnold? It is the journey to Ithaca. Yep, up there. Yep. Okay. And these are images uh, from Ithaca. And Arnold and Dora and Alexander have lived for extended periods of time on Ithaca. Isn't that beautiful? I will leave it there. Um, so, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Costadina. That was most informative, most wonderful indeed. Who could have said all this better than a writer and a poet like you? If you would like to see more of uh, Costadina Dunis or hear more from her, you can come along to the history and culture seminars at the Greek community, which take place on Thursday nights. You can find the program on the internet. And now I would like to call upon the president of the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne and Victoria, Mr. P Bill Papasteriadis, to present our honoured guest with the official plaque. Thank you. Um, and it is a great night tonight, and good evening to everyone. And Dina, I did enjoy your talk enormously and um, I thought it was quite moving, your anecdotes about your own personal story about tying in your presentation today and the, um, its relationship with Arnold and your own story through your own family. Um, but I've got a small little problem with your talk today, I must admit, Dina, and Dina's looking at me a little bit concerned as I say this. 
The problem is, Danny, you've left nothing original for me to say. <laughs> you've covered the topic so well that, in fact, I've got very little. But what I'd like to do is to acknowledge and pay tribute to the profound literary achievements of Arnold Zabel on behalf of the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne, Victoria. He has had a lifelong commitment and passion to telling the Australian migrant story. And so in the Greek community, we have adopted him as one of us. And as my brother indicated last night in his own discussion with Chris Chalkers, he was saying that in 1984, he had asserted in one of his talks that he'd adopted Patrick White as one of us. <laughs> well, we adopt people left, right and centre, Arnold, <laughs> no matter what the relationship is. But in particular, I'd like us to express, and we would like to express our appreciation of the role that you have taken as president of Penn and in the way that you've used it as an advocate for refugees' rights. You've done this in a hard-hitting political manner and also, more importantly, you've expressed the human story in every migrant's journey. And so it is fitting that Arnold is with us for the inaugural Antipodes Writers' Festival, given his deep personal connection he has with Greece, having worked in Piraeus in 1973. Now, you didn't say that, did you, Dina? There you go, I've got one little original thing. That is married to Dora from Ithaca, and that his books touch so deeply to these matters. And as Arnold put in his own words very recently, Apotin protistigmi puvrethika sin Athena, ipastone aftomu aniko saftitigi. So, Arnold, may I invite you up here for a, well, a gift and also a plaque on behalf of the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne, Victoria, for your contribution to the arts, to refugees, to all things true to our heart and the, what we're trying to achieve also through our organisation, which is to bring together our own voices and all of our voices. Congratulations. Thank you, Bill. And um, not only for your beautiful words, but I would like to thank you personally and also on behalf of the working party and the conveners for your unwavering support of this initiative, which culminated to the Antipodes Writers Festival. As you have already heard, tonight's event is a celebration. And what would a celebration be without music? Unthinkable, unimaginable, especially for us Greeks. So that's why we brought in the musicians, three of them to be precise, Anthea Sideropoulos, Jaco Papadopoulos, and Achilles Yagoulis. But please bear with us a few more minutes. At this point, I would like to ask those of you who have not switched off the mobiles or put them on silent <laughs> to please do so. Ladies and gentlemen, the day has drawn to an end. Your work is done. Outside, a storm is brewing. The wind is rising. It mocks the sea and rattles the shutters. But inside, here, the fire is burning. And the fire loves you. Archi to Paramithiu, the fairy tale begins. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Arnold Zabel, the storyteller. Well, I've got to say that um, I thought as I came here, oh, I feel good, I'm not nervous. This is all under control, uh, but um, uh, 
I'm close to tears, uh, and uh, bear with me because uh, I, I feel overwhelmed, utterly overwhelmed. And um, just to relax the tension a bit, um, I'll, I'll begin with an anecdote. Why? Why do I love Yutaiki and why do I love Queen's Creek? It's, it's because of this. In the village of Ayos Saranta, the village of the 40 saints, where Dora, Alexander and I have spent a lot of time, we often go walking. We, no, we were known as Metapodia, someone <laughs> called us. We go walking everywhere. And, um, uh, and usually it takes, if you go directly from Ayos Saranta down to Stavros, the main village in the northern part of Utica, it takes about half an hour, I think, walk. But quite often it can take two to three hours <laughs> because there's a detour here and a door open there and a coffee here and a story there and you meet the shepherd and he tells you another story and so it goes. Uh, but finally you come to the village and my favourite place in the village is the old Cup of Neon. Uh, there's all kinds of modern bars there now, but this old Cup of Neon, the old sailors and seamen, they're still playing cards and they'll tell you stories. And um, the last time I was there, unfortunately, it's, you know, we're due for another trip soon, was the last Saturday in September 2006. And it's about, say, 10 a.m. And I'm sitting on the patio which overlooks the Ionian uh, Sea. Well, if you look, uh, if you look down across uh, the other side you can see the island of Kepalonia and you can right down below a very very steep road is uh, uh, the Bay of Poli um, under which they say is an, a an ancient city in the sea and I'm sitting there this is the most beautiful place on earth having a Greek coffee a Turkish coffee <laughs> wars have been felt o fought over that <laughs> But this little cup of coffee, uh, this is the miracle of Greece. How can so much be contained in such a small cup? <laughs> <laughs> and that's before you get to reading the, uh, the dregs. But <laughs> so we're sitting there and uh, I'm writing in my journal, if you sit in the old cup of Stavros long enough, everyone you need to meet and everything you need to know will come your way. And a guy steps out and says, West Coast Eagles by one point. <laughs> <laughs> and in Melbourne it was 5 p.m. and you know, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, match had just ended and there you go. Uh, but it's true, that happened. Only, only on Ithaca. Now, there are people I wish to thank, and um, many people I wish to thank. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank uh, Dina for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Constantina, a, a, a writer dreams to have his words received in a certain way, and you can't please everyone. You know, there are some that tune into your work and others that don't. That, that's how it is for all writers, but to be received in this way is overwhelming. Interestingly enough, um, you picked out Wanderers and Dreamers, a much a lesser known book, and you certainly picked out that little gem, King Lear, um, translated by and improved upon the original by <laughs> Reuben Finkelstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, and that's true too. <laughs> uh, but look, thank you so much for that presentation and, and thank you for working so hard to make this happen. And I'd like to thank also um, Helen Nikas for co-convening this extraordinary weekend. I think it's a historical moment in the Greek community. It really is an historical moment. It's the, I think it's the forerunner of many such gatherings and uh, the work it takes to organise something like this, to get together the cream of the Australian Greek writers all in one place on one weekend is an extraordinary achievement. And I want to say right at the beginning that I owe a lot to Greek literature and Greek writers. And one of the ways in which I came to see the soul of Greece was through reading Nikos Kazantzakis 
Stratus Mirabilis. Stratus Mirabilis, uh, his novel, The Mermaid Madonna, set on the island of Lesbos, is an extraordinary novel. It should be a, a classic that is read and reread, um, and his other books too. Uh, when it comes to the landscape of Greece, there were three poets that that blew my mind in the way in which they saw that glowing landscape. And they are two of them won the Nobel Peace, uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature, and that is George Seferis and Odysseus Elitis. Uh, but another favourite of mine is Yanis Ritsos, uh, and there are many, many others, especially the poets. Um, but I also would like to acknowledge the extraordinary talent in the Greek Australian literary community, um, some of whom are here, as I said, this weekend. I want to personally acknowledge friends of mine, Greek writers, Tom Pitsinas, fantastic writer, Andreas Litras, his great play Odyssey, um, keeps playing years after it was first performed, Dimitri Kakli, the, his terrific book Motherland, set on the island of Tenedos, is a great inspiration. Tina Giannoukas, uh, Giannoukos is here tonight. I think she's an example of the future of Greek writing, uh, a woman's voice that is uh, unique and, um, and, and important. Uh, Gina Batoukas, another writer who has written a wonderful novel set on Zakynthos, uh, not far from the island of Ithaca. Christos Cholkos, of course, uh, among many others, and also Helen Nikas and Constantina Dunas, who are both terrific writers in their own right. And here I want to single a particular writer out. And she's here tonight. Uh, I think this writer is one of those writers that has been neglected. And a writer that of extraordinary, extraordinary subtlety and power, and that's Antigone Kafala. Uh, I think that her, there's, there's a move now, well, text, my publisher has recently published what they call Australian classics, and I think uh, there are a number of books that Antigone has written that should go in that series. And while I say this, um, one of the reasons she is published is because of Helen Nikas' extraordinary publishing company, Our Publications, which is unique, not only publishing writers who may not otherwise be heard, but her books um, include translations. Uh, in fact, one of Antigone's book is in three languages, and that's, that's a very brave venture and a very important venture, <laughs> and she's kept the spirit of these writers alive. So thank you, Helen, for that fantastic work that that publishing company has performed. And then two writers that uh, I don't know personally, but I think uh, I've learned a lot from uh, Tess and Peter Lysiotis, and I know them through their work and through their plays. Um, and there can be many, many more. Forgive me if I, if I haven't touched on many others that de deserve to be touched on. But there are many people to thank personally for leading me into the heart and soul of Greek culture. But the first person, without any doubt, uh, above all, uh, is uh, my beautiful wife, Dora. Um, the daughter of Athanasios Vavarigos from Ayos Saranda and of Lily Vavarigos Nikikatos from the village of Exoyi, uh, and also the, um, uh, whose, whose father was also uh, uh, from Exoyi, who we saw his photograph before, uh, Konkikatos, and uh, 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 Lily's mother, Polymnia, was from the main town of Vathi. So in a way, her family has got the lot from the port right up to the heights of Exoyi. And it's Dora, who I met in Chakpinas. Uh, I don't know if some of you remember Chakpinas. It was in Heffenden Lane, uh, just off Lonsdale Street. And it was a great place to go. As soon as you climbed those stairs, you heard the wonderful Rebetica music being played. And I always associate meeting Dora with uh, uh, the great Rebetica singers, I particularly Rosa Ashkenazi, who came from Smyrna and also, of course, was from a, a Jewish background, uh, but ended up, and I love this story, in the hashish dens of Piraeus. So, um, but there are many, many others, and I think um, 
it was a romance. It was a very romantic way to meet someone. And, um, and certainly one thing I identified uh, with in Dora, and I think that was mutual right from the beginning, is that she was a seeker. She wanted to understand. It was more important than material wealth. You know, what was more important was to understand what is it? What makes us human? What makes us thick? And part of that understanding involved an exploration um, of family. And um, uh, when we first went to Ithaca, uh, we would sit uh, for hours on end. Uh, this was back in 1990 with old Uncle Dimitri. Um, we'd sit on the balcony, which overlooks the island of Lepkada and um, in the distance, and also in the little kitchen where the fire burns. It was he who said, the fire loves you. It was Uncle Dimitri who said, the fire loves you. You don't make these things up. And, the, and uh, he was such a beautiful guy. He was uh, Arthur Nassis, who I never met. Uh, Dora's father died well before I met Dora. But um, he was the older brother. And he was the one that first told us the extraordinary story of brotherly love. The two boys, whose photograph we saw before, they were the two boys in that ancestral shot, um, who built a boat called Brotherly Love and sailed it around the islands. But one stayed behind and endured civil war, war, resistance, many things, and the other one came to Australia and was only happy when he was building boats and sailing them on Port Phillip Bay. So I owe so much, and I should also mention here uh, Dora's extraordinary mother, Lily uh, Varvarigos. You know, it's interesting, Constantino, you talk about Sundays. Every Sunday we were there, and she was uh, uh, just... She was just a warm, beautiful person who uh, would just create, uh, just create a celebration just by being there, by being present. And um, the fig tree really is about her. The, f the name the fig tree comes from the fig tree that she had in her back garden, the most extraordinary tree. Uh, and uh, it was very, very sad when Lily passed away all too soon, uh, back in 1994. Now. Along came Alexander, and um, Alexander then became our co-traveller on the island of Ithaca, and um, uh, so he became the third metapodia, <laughs> 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 uh, except, except that he used to live on my shoulders. The first time we went, <laughs> the first time we, we went to the island, he was three going on four, and he lived on my shoulders, and I just mentioned two brief memories. I would say, arguably, the two happiest t moments of my life. Um, and uh, one is walking from Anoyi, a village right on top of a mountain, all the way down to Stavros with Alexander on my shoulder with the full moon following us. And I was singing, I'm being followed by a moon shadow. <laughs> At that stage, Alexander was too young to tell me I've got a terrible voice. <laughs> but... Um, this happened, we came down to Stavros and met Dennis Sikiotis, who we had dinner with that night, but I lost my watch on the way down. I don't think I wanted time uh, to go on. I wanted it to stop. And the other wonderful memory, of many memories, is working in the olive grove uh, in that summer of, uh, uh, well, the autumn of 1997. And... Um, uh, I'd go up at 6 o'clock and, and work in the groves. This went on for a number of months. And Dora and Alexander would come up mid-morning with uh, this warm bread that the baker had just uh, um, baked and delivered. And you just take the inside out and inside you put, as un Uncle Dimitri used to say, Ligo Tomato, Ligo uh, Thierry, Ligo Elias, Ligo Lavi. Right? <laughs> what more could you want? And then um, Alexander would go off and play in the goat house and, and I'd get back to work. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's a, it, it was a dream. I think it was a dream. And, um, uh, and then I, I have to say that um, I need to acknowledge here the Ithaca and Pareya, both on the island and here in Melbourne. Uh, you've got old Aunt Yorigia, who at the age of 90 is still going strong. And um, 
if you want to know what she's like, we're sitting in the patriarchal, right, in the patriarchal house in Ayos Saranda. Dimitri has passed away by this stage, and we're watching on Ithaca, on TV, a Fran Francis Ford Coppola produced version of the Odyssey with Greek subtitles. <laughs> and your ear is watching, she's saying, ah, oh, look, at, look at this, there is, there is uh, Odysseus with beautiful Circe, and there he is with beautiful Calypso. And then she said, bah, bah, bah. all these years I've been told we should wait, that uh, we should remain faithful. Put down the sinner, he was a whore. <laughs> he was having fun all that time. <laughs> and we were made to believe we should keep, uh, in, you know, weaving our shroud. <laughs> If only I would have known. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, look, there's so many cousin of Timio. The beautiful Theo Aguilo. Theo Aguilo was just all heart. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, cousin Yanni uh, and his family. Um, he, um, became, he, by necessity, was a seaman um, and uh, spent many months away from his family so he could... Uh, you know, put food on the table, and many, many others. I, I forgive me who I've left out. But the Pareya here is very important, and I feel honoured that people like Dinas Katsamas, who's taken the photographs, Peter Paksenos, um, who gave me a story that led to the character Old Nico in Sea of Many Returns, um, and that uh, I want to acknowledge the Vlasopoulos family, and especially the late Jim Vlasopoulos, who you know, every Easter, every Christmas we would gather. He was the life of the party. We were very sad to see him depart. And just as an example, with Sea of Many Returns, I was in the last month of editing and we were uh, at a gathering, one of our great Easter um, gathering gatherings at his house in Drummond Street. And I was talking to one of the Ithacans there and he said, you know, I was a seaman for many years and you know the most amazing thing that used to happen? We'd see this black cloud coming from the distance, a black cloud, and the black cloud got closer and closer and closer until it was over the boat, and then it would descend on the boat. It was thousands of migrating birds, and, it, and he said they would hitch a ride on the boat you know, and stay there for three days, and then they'd leave, leaving behind bird shit, you know, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and... Uh, the next day, I went to the publisher and I said, I've got to, the editor, I said, I've got to weave this in. I've got to bring this in. And of course, she let me weave it in. The, the details came out of these conversations, out of being together. Um, I know Stratia uh, and Jim, two dear friends um, that uh, we still see to this day, were part of that parea. Um, you know, Lula Black, uh, Lula and George Kusavellas. Look. Forgive me if I haven't mentioned all the names, but um, you mean so much to me and, um, and to our family. Now, um, I, I also want to acknowledge where it all began. It began for me in Carlton. In the 1950s and 60s, we were multicultural before the word was in vogue. And um, uh, we didn't know the word, but we lived side by side with our harmonies and conflicts but mainly our harmonies, I should say, Greeks, Jews, Italian, Yugoslav immigrants and working class Aussies. Tonight, I can't go, there's a reunion organised by Hoppo. Hoppo, Jimmy Hopkins, always or twice a year organises a reunion for us um, at the Kew Junction Hotel. <laughs> and um, he rings up, he says, Arnie, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> We're meeting, we're meeting at the Q Junction Hotel. <laughs> you better be there, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to him, I say to him, look, I've got a Greek there. What's this Greek do? You know, is that more important than meeting your mates? <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, he'll forgive me this time. But um, I'm really thrilled that tonight um, uh, I have uh, in the audience uh, Evelyn Eftimiadis, or Evelyn Roditas now, and because 
it was her family who introduced me to Greek hospitality right back in 1963-64. I'd go to these amazing parties at her uh, house in um, uh, Chambers Street, Brunswick, and that's where I first heard Theodorakis, Hatshidakis, those great performers, and her father, her beautiful father, would sit down and talk to me. You know what he loved talking about? Zero. The concept of zero. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold, zero. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> you know, later on I had another version of this. Isoi in a mia tripa misto nero. Life is a hole in the water. You see? Zero. <laughs> so, eat donuts. Okay. <laughs> That wasn't planned. <laughs> um, but um, also I have to say that uh, there was that wonderful first journey to Greece, and I want to mention it tonight in 1973. I was working in Glyfada near Piraeus in a boatyard, but down in the boatyard one, the, I would hear these extraordinarily sad stories because the Greek junta was in power. And the words I remember was, we have no more tears. We have no more tears for what happened to our children when the tanks entered the Polytechnia. And then I was lucky enough to be there when the liberation took place in 1974 um, and, and uh, Greece uh, was liberated. And my heart goes out to Greece now. You know, it's very interesting. You know, I don't want to enter into the discussion here, of course, but I want to just say one thing. Isn't it a paradox? Isn't it a paradox that it takes four out three hours and you enjoy your life walking from Ayosaranda down to Stavros, but in a way, Greece is paying for that paradox. People go there because it's beyond materialism to some extent, and you can sit down and talk to friends. But if you sit down and talk to friends, the economy could go down the gurgler too. I mean, there's a paradox there, and I think it's worth mentioning that paradox that the country that has proven to be a place where many people go to enjoy themselves is now suffering so much and being squeezed so hard. I find that very hard to take, and I, it, it's quite unbearable. There's something very unfair about it. Uh, with all the other reasons for it happening, there's something unfair about that. Um, I want to end, and, and before we introduce uh, 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 a reading and musical presentation, I want to end by just saying that um, this, I guess my, the heart and soul of what I do is to honour those people who made the journey, whether they be my Jewish refugee parents and their generation, the wonderful Greek immigrants I've met that made their way from Ithaki and other parts of Greece to distant Australia and the city of Melvurni. Um, whether it be um, Amal Basri from Iraq, who became such a close friend, who survived that terrible disaster on the Civex by clinging to a corpse for 20 hours, and uh, whose story I was privileged to tell in uh, violin lessons. Uh, whether it be many, many other groups that are coming here now from many countries in the world. Um, and I know they suffer from something which young generations don't understand. In a way, Sea of Many Returns was deliberately a meditation on what the Greeks call nostalgia. Nostalgia means literally the pain of longing for the return. Now, very often when you say nostalgia, young people will say to you, nostalgia, that's just sentimental, whatever. You know, they live in this global community that's so instant. However, there are those who can't get home. And the, what immediately struck me about the island of Ithaca and the stories I heard was that the ancient archetype of Odysseus who left that island thinking he would be away for one year fighting the Trojan Wars and came back 20 years later is repeated again and again but in a modern guise. And there were many on the island of Ithaca who disappeared and never returned. Um, and it's summed up in this beautiful distinction that's made by Walter Benjamin, a wonderful social critic working 
um, in the 1930s, wrote a lovely essay called The Storyteller. And he said there are two pure types of storytelling. Most of us uh, tell stories of both, but these are the two pure types. The first type is what he called, he called the uh, merchant seaman. This is the story of the voyager who goes from place to place. Now these journeys are spatial. Look at the places I've been to. Look what I've seen. It's, um, uh, it, it can be Odysseus going off on his journeys. It can be uh, Jason in search of the golden fleece in the Black Sea. Uh, many, it can be Marco Polo coming back with the recipe for spaghetti. <laughs> um, it can be any one of us coming back with slides no one wants to watch or whatever. <laughs> and we, we bring back the law, L-O-R-E, the law of faraway places. However, there's another type of storyteller, and I'll end by illustrating this second, often neglected type of storyteller with a little story. Back in 1990, on our first prolonged stay in Ithaca, Dora and I were up on the top of the mountain. We were with um, uh, at this this monastery called Kathara, and, and uh, we it was a beautiful Ionian day, and we decided we'd walk down to the village of Anoyi, a couple of kilometres down, down the mountain. And within about 20 minutes, the sky had turned black and the heavens opened up and we opened our umbrellas and they were torn to shreds and the goats were now peering at us through the hail and the wind. And um, uh, we, what could we do except laugh hysterically down to the first house? We knocked on the door. A woman aged 93 invited us inside Ten minutes later, we're sitting by the fire and our clothes are drying and I'm wearing one of her dear departed outfits <laughs> and Dora is wearing a dress that smells of ancestral dust. <laughs> 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 and she begins to tell stories, extraordinary stories. And these stories um, she could tell for days on end. And yet, she said, I have never left the island. I rarely leave the village to go down to Vathi. What stories are they? This is the second type of storyteller. The resident tiller of the soil. Isn't that a beautiful term? The resident tiller of the soil. These stories are not spatial as much as temporal. They're handed down through the generations. They know the stories of the ancestors. Indigenous people are the storytellers of that kind here. Constantina, Constantina was right to acknowledge them at the beginning. and. Um, it can be when you're writing something like Scraps of Heaven, the old guy that stands at the, been at the local pub for the last 40 years, he knows one neighbourhood. You know, this in a way is glorified gossip. She knew who planted every olive grove and the fights. People will kill each other over a metre of dirt. She could tell stories um, of the people who eloped and ended up in distant Australia and Melbourne. So this second type of storyteller is at the half and very often is overlooked and neglected. And that's why I ended, I ended Sea of Men Returns by inverting the Odyssey. And when I say inverting the Odyssey, I mean at the end of the Odyssey, um, three men, Odysseus and his son Telemachus, go down to see uh, their father, Laertes, old Laertes, who's become a, a humble um, uh, farmer at that stage. And it's a story about how they come to recognise each other. Well, the father wouldn't accept that the son had come down there, except he started to say, I was there as a kid when you planted this tree and that tree, etc., etc. But I was very, very um, concerned to invert that. And at the end of Sea, sea of Many Returns, we have three women, three generations of women, and Xanthi, who is based to some extent on Dora, goes down with her daughter, Martina, as a fictional character, um, and um, she goes down to see old Auntie Rini in the far village of Perahori, and there um, we sit, meet someone who's almost blind but knows the streets of that village like the back of a hand, and to have that union between those three generations of women, 
I think, uh, was the way to end. And, um, and so, uh, with that in mind, I want to now say, invite the musicians. We are, and, I, and I want to mention one other person. Um, we are going to dedicate this uh, musical storytelling, just readings and music um, presentation to uh, Costa Tsikaderi. Costa Tsikaderi uh, was a beautiful man. Um, he was a wonderful musician. He was a generous spirit. When he passed away all too soon, we were devastated. I see here Roger and Therese from the, um, from the Boat, who were very close to him and very close to musicians from many parts of the globe here tonight. And I'm, I'm just thrilled you're here. And we were all touched by Costa. Uh, Costa knew Greek culture through and through. He taught me a lot. We worked together, a storyteller and musician. And so all three musicians that are going to perform tonight were close to him. First, Anthea Sideropoulos, who is a dear friend who um, has made this musical uh, thing happen, um, whose father, Theo Sideropoulos, was one of my heroes, the first Greek mayor of Collingwood and of uh, a great first Greek member of parliament in Victoria. And uh, they lived together, the Tsikaderis and Sideropoulos family lived together when they first arrived in a house in Abbotsford. Wonderful stories about that house in Abbotsford. And so, um, Anthea Sideropoulos is going to be joined by two wonderful musicians, Jacob Papadopoulos, who appears on the Fig Tree CD, and also the wonderful Achillea uh, Yanguli, who plays with the Habibis, but also has generously uh, donated his time tonight. So please welcome uh, Anthea <laughs> and uh, Jacob and Achillea. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, from us. Achilleus Yangulis and Jacob Papadopoulos and myself. We're absolutely stoked to be here. We're very honoured. It's like old times, Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is just go straight into it. These are readings from the fig tree and sea of many returns. And uh, let's let the journey begin. Beware, dear reader, the story you are about to be told is a fairy tale, a romance. There will be time enough later to tear it to shreds. In the meantime, sit back and become a child again. Is there not enough darkness in the world? Come, sit by the fire. Allow the voice of the storyteller to soothe you while you gaze at the flames. Perhaps it is an uncle, a grandmother, perhaps a lifelong friend. The day has drawn to an end. Your work is done. Outside, a storm is brewing. The wind is rising. It mocks the seas and rattles the shutters. But inside, the fire is burning and the fire loves you. Achi tu parimidiu. The fairy tale begins. Kalosperesas. Good evening to you. Up 
πιας ψυχής για σένα ναι είναι γραμμένο από το κλάμα κάποιας ψυχής Στο σπίτι σου σε μια γωνιά και σβήσω πια τότε μικρό μου μπροστά στο σπίτι σου σε μια We are gathered in the village square in the spring of 1912, seated at tables beneath the plane tree. Couples are dancing tangos dressed in their European best. The musicians are playing. Nakis on accordion, Vasilu, Vasili on clarino, Michalis on violin. Basted lambs are turning on the spit. I leave the weeding party with Strati and climb above it so ye. The music evaporates. The square is a diminishing circle of light. We leap over the chapel wall, crest the summit and scan the sea. Stratus picks up a handful of stones and flings them into the unknown. I am leaving, he says, joining my godfather Thomas in Australia. I shrug my shoulders. It's a familiar shrug that says, well, you're leaving, so what? That's how it is. Stock alot. Go on your good way. There's nothing here, he says. Thomas has been away 10 years. He manages an oyster bar in Kilgourley, a city built on gold. In five years, I'll return with enough money to buy a kaiki and double the size of my groves. What can I do with just a few hectares of land? We remain locked in our thoughts. Far below us, a ship crawls by en route to the Adriatic or some foreign port. I pick up a rock and hurl it as far as I can. In this moment, I hate my father. I hate Strati. I hate the sea and distant lands. I want to expunge myself to erase all hope. The rock hurtles into the darkness, clear of the slopes. I turn my back on the summit and begin my descent. Michalis calls me over when I return. The celebration is at its height. Couples are dancing closer, moving in the shadows. I learned this tango in Bucharest when I went there with your father, he says. He rests the violin on his knees. Play the wind. Play the wind, that Sagaini would say. To know an instrument is a great gift. Better to be a musician than one of the guests. We are present, but also apart. A step away from trouble, he winks. Michalis lifts the violin in preparation. A good musician is an unobtrusive presence, he says. We see the budding romances, the flirtations, the winks and caresses. We observe the widows and wives with absent husbands and know those who are resigned to their fate from those who steal away to regain a man's touch. The musicians resume. A circle is forming. Mahalas hands over his fiddle and breaks in. The men squat and clap to Mahalas' solo dance. He weaves and faints and lowers his body to sweep the dirt with his palms. 
His steps are emboldened by the circling men urging him on with their quickening beat. Days later, when he teaches me the melody on the violin, Mahalas will tell me that dancing the Zabekiko in a circle is the Turkish way, while those who perform solo are dancing Greek style. He will tell me this is our eternal tension, the conflict between individual and group. He will tell me that within our men, there is an urge to break away, to travel alone. Even so, the lone dancer is in circle, supported by the group. He will tell me that the Zebekiko is played in 9-8 time, and he will teach me the complex rhythm, how to capture it in the sliding pressure of the fingers, the movements of the bow. It is a rhythm that turns against itself, a rhythm that wants to defy rhythm and impel the dancer to hurl himself beyond all bounds. The nine in the equation is our defiance and anarchic spirit. The eight, our need for each other. Keep them in harness and all will be well. Nahalas is dancing in the Zerbekiko. His upper body remains poised. The steps are improvised yet contained. Around him each man is dancing alone but held within the orb. Above them, the mountain performs its own silent dance dictated by millennia of hail, wind and storm. Within two years, every man in the circle will be gone to war or sea or alien lands. Michalis accompanies me as I walk home and places an arm around my shoulders. A true Ionian musician returns to the first sounds wind, sea and earth. He understands that the winds rise from and return to stillness. He discerns the faint pulse of undertoes in the sea depths and he detects the silence at the core of all sound. He cleans his mind of thoughts and does not forget what he hears and the moment he first heard it. Some day, while standing watch late at night aboard ship or stranded on some alien shore, the memory of what you hear now will keep you company. How many sounds can you discern? Put them together and allow them to harmonize and you have a cantata, a serenade. Take them apart, but keep yourself together and you have the zebekiko. And take away the musicians and you will return to the heart of all music, natural sound. Nahalas puts a finger to his lips. Listen, he says. We are standing on the path beside the uppermost house. I hear a rustling of undergrowth, a sound of laughter, cascading, fading. And even at this height, a mere decibel above the silence, the breath of the sea, we are enveloped in it, above it, yet a part of it. I open my eyes and Machalas is laughing. His mouth is open. I see a flash of gold filling. His face is a paradox of lines without care. He places his arms around my shoulders. That sound is in me as in you, as it once was in your mother's womb. That night, I dream I am surrounded by water, floating on a sliver of firm earth. Terra firma, yet nothing remains still. Islands collide and drift apart. I try to pin them down, but they are gone. My father is gone. Stratus is gone. Mother is dressed in widow's black. And the winning women are scaling the paths back to their groves, walking their slow, damned walk. And I'm running past them in rage, scaling the heights. I am above the island, and the Khalas is laughing. I am dazzled by the gold in his mouth. I peer inside and see oceans churning, armies clashing, seamen drowning, birds circling on wild winds. His enlarged tongue expels baying mobs like pieces of dirt, draws back everything it has expelled, and moments later spits it all back out. Τη θάλασσα έγινα για σένα. Όταν φορτωμιάζει αυτή, ταξιδεύω εγώ. Άλλο τη αγάπη σου ασημένιο κύμα είναι το ασύνδετο. 
αστέρισου άδειο και οδηγό. There are ghosts on the ancestral road and scattered clues to a veiled past. And there are many detours. One path rises towards Exoyi, a village perched on a ridge overlooking the Ionian Sea. In the first decade of the last century, Alexander's great-grandfather, Dora's maternal grandfather, Constantino Kekatos, farewelled his loved ones and made his way from Exoyi down this path. He descended along a well-worn route that threaded past a string of hamlets, vineyards, and olive groves to the port of Friques. On his back, he carried a knapsack and a violin. I have often imagined Constantino's journey. He left as the first droplet of sun flooded the roofs. He left as the first cry of a newborn lamb. He left while the villagers were stirring, moving about their kitchens like sleepwalkers in search of light. He left with his face set like a sail waiting for wind, and he left alone to avoid the irritation of tearful farewells. He glanced back at the steep lanes of stone steps that divided the village homes. 
For the final time he scanned the valley, the lower hamlets, the windmills upon the heights. The eight sails on each meal lay dormant against the rising light. He moved between olive trees and vineyards and solitary chapels shadowed by cypress groves. The village vanished into the mist and for a moment his heart tightened. He felt a faint twinge of distress. Then he quickened his steps and hurried down the steep descent towards Fricus Bay. A rowboat conveyed him to a larger kayiki. He clambered aboard the vessel and gazed at the kayiki's wake as it moved out to sea. He was mesmerised by the wake. It churned with infinite possibilities. It hummed with the melody of movement and change. A journey that had begun with a descent was now moving on an even keel. He walked to the foredeck and watched the bow part the water before him. He returned to the wake that streamed from the stern like the aftermath of a difficult birth. Constantino was 16 years old when he left. He never returned. And, it is said, he rarely talked about the islands of his birth, the island that had nurtured him. Πέρασατε τις μπόρες και όλες τις κακές τις ώρες με μια βαλίτσα μοναχά ήρθατε στην ξενιτιά δάκρυα ρίξατε πολλά στη καινούρια σας πατρίδα Αχ μες στην ξενιτιά Δουλέψατε πολύ σκληρά Μες όλα αυτά με μάθατε να ζω Και γι' αυτό σας ευχαριστώ Αχ μάνα και πατέρα Τρέξατε σαν τον αέρα για να βοηθήσετε με στα κοινά η αγάπη σας από μια καρδιά ελπίδες όρο στην ξενιτιά τα όνειρά σας να γίνουν πραγματικότητα Αχ με στην ξενιτιά δουλέψατε πολύ σκληρά με όλα αυτά με μάθατε να ζω και γι' αυτό σας ευχαριστώ. You sailed across the oceans with a suitcase in each hand and the tears still fresh on your cheeks as you both set foot in this foreign land. The hardships you've endured, unknown territories to persevere through, and in all the chaos, and in all the passion, and in all the chaos, and in all the pain, you taught me how to live. Ach, me stinks and it ya, du lepsate, polis clira, me solafta. the end of our stay is approaching, I am obsessed 
as on previous sojourns with tattooing the landscape on my memory. I have inherited the Ithacan phobia, the fear that I may never return. I am Metapodia, the mad one who walks. And my daughter Martina remains my willing accomplice. We walk the ports of Chione and Fikes, Poly Bay and Afalas. Nets are sprawled in heaps on sea walls and jetties. On the Vathi foreshore, there are Alfa Romeos, Mercedes, BMWs and Volvos, the imported cars of the noble rich, waiting like the bare-masted ships that once filled the harbour in winter. We walk familiar ground and perceive new meanings. The mill that Andreas once tended traps the wind within its hollows. We stray into the lowlands and are lost in gullies thick with wild olives. Dogs burst from timber shacks and stop abruptly, confined by their leashes to ferocious barking. We find our way back onto an overgrown path and come upon the ruins of churches with cracked walls of faded frescoes. We stumble towards the heights like drunkards over fields of limestone. The scent of the sea rises to meet the scent of the mountain. The skies are whirling, the earth turning and returning, the sea vanishing, reappearing. This is not an Ithaca in waiting, an idealised figment of memory, but a living presence, an island that bends labouring breath and muscle to its brute power. The summer is long over, the harvest ended. With each passing day, the island is ebbing further into stillness, and it is the old Ithaca that returns, that which has outlived the departures of Velenia. We wander hamlets we have rarely set foot in. Goats scatter into the undergrowth, a washing line strung between two pine tilts, trousers and vests towards the heavens. A fishing net is spread on the side of the road like the tentacles of a giant squid. An elderly woman in widow's black scales the lee side of the mountain. This year, Tipota, she says, nothing. And last year? Last year the trees were dripping with olives, but the oil was putrid. She screws up her face. Next year will be better, I suggest. Why, she replies with contempt. Flies burrow into the fruit to lay their eggs. The eggs hatch, the worms feast, and the olives drop from the trees, sucked dry by parasites. She spits on the ground. And if the olives are good, so what? The middlemen will siphon off the profits. She looks at us for a long time and says, Ah, it gives you an appetite being up here, doesn't it? And in a voice barely stronger than a whisper, she sings, Life has two doors. I opened one and came in one morning, and by the time evening arrived, I had left by the other. The last door is open and waiting, she cackles. We continue up the mountain to a plateau. Again, the island is turning on its axis. The path conveys us to a remote enclave where goats graze under the watchful eyes of an elderly couple. A saddled donkey stands beside them. The Ionian eddies below us. And as we walk, I know that Martina is one story that will remain untold. She will be free soon enough to come and go as she pleases, free to weave her life as she wishes. On the eve of our departure, we return to the ruins of Homer's school, Mentor's site of healing and the landscape of his dreaming. We climb the stone steps to the upper rung and sit where he sealed his pact with Stratus. The cliff path to the Marmacus overlooking the Bay of Othalus is a track of silver, the Ionian a rippling skin of crimson. Upon its waters, a single Kayiki is returning to the port of Frikes. It is the hour of the homecoming. The crew is within sight of the shepherd's huts on the Marmacus. Somewhere on the island, a half is waiting. I remain seated beside Martina long after the Kayiki has burst. A breeze flares and leaps like an invisible flame through the ruins. The lights of the villages are appearing. The lighthouse of Lefkada is issuing warnings to strangers. The church on the lower hill tolls the passing of the hours. 
it is time to resume the weaving. Ahi, tu para mi view. The fairy tale begins. Kalisterasas, good evening to you. song. This paragraph sums up the way Costa and I felt about what it is to be in this country and why we have to know that there's always another generation seeking refuge. And the song is a beautiful song that Costa composed. Um, the mighty and the humble. 
Nikrike in Magali. I think it should be a, a kind of anthem. And uh, this paragraph, I want to explain what precedes it, except to say it was a wonderful moment in the island of Zakynthos in 2002 when a boat of asylum seekers was rescued. And I end like this. To Costa. Perhaps we need to venture out and become seafarers again. We need to see the ropes being untied and flung on board. We need to cast off and watch the gap grow between water and earth to drift a while beyond sight of all land and then return and see the continent anew to see that it is an island after all. We need to approach with nothing but the clothes on our back and hope that awaiting us is not one-eyed cyclops ready to hurl us into the sea, but people of good heart. Perhaps then we will recall that our own forebears were strangers who approached these alien shores by boat. <laughs> Thank you, Archie. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Anthea. And thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to Dana <laughs> and Helen. Thank you, la ladies and gentlemen. And this is the end of this beautiful evening. I couldn't have thought a better combination of the storytelling of Anna Zabel and the music. One more round of applause for Anthea.
Jacob. And the mighty Achillea. And I've just noticed actually that they are called the Anthea Trio. I was about to baptize you tonight, the Holy Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> we could be that. Uh, yeah, you s yes, you can. And you are the female element. Absolutely. I was always very upset why there is no female in there the Holy is, Trinity. It's just never written. Oh, I can't oh, it's read. written out. I there you go. That should be written down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> to get together with the story, together with the story of Penelope. What was she up to 20 years? I'd like to know. <laughs> now, Please if you like it. these beautiful musicians, you have the opportunity to see them again on, um, at the Velvet Room this Tuesday coming up, the 19th of June at 7 p.m. The Velvet Room is at the Thornbury Theatre. Also, they are performing on Saturday the 21st of July at 8 p.m. at the Boat World Music Cafe in Fitzroy. And they are singing, of course, Greek music, Boat style music sessions. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.